The views and opinions expressed in this video are those of the speakers and panelists and do not necessarily reflect the position of the Ethos Institute for Public Christianity and its founding institutions and organizations. Is Jesus God? Migrant workers and human rights from a Christian perspective. Marriage and family. ISIS presents a much bigger threat. How do we integrate the Bible with our scientific understanding? Are you able to actually describe and articulate clearly your own sense of purpose in life? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of ETOS Institute, a very warm welcome to our Zoom webinar come book launch. Uh, very warm, especially because outside is raining and it's cold. So I guess maybe for this time, being able to do so through a webinar is quite suitable. Uh, as mentioned, I'm Dr. Tan Ju. I'm the moderator for this book launch. Uh, also, as mentioned, this is the first time that we are doing a virtual book launch over Zoom. So we really look forward to your feedback on any aspects of our talk after this. So do, do let us know. Um, I just want to say a few words uh, in case some of you may have missed the opening video about ETHOS. So the ETHOS Institute for Public Christianity was formed by NCCS, the National Council of Churches, uh, Trinity Theological College, and the Bible Society of Singapore in 2014. Its main purpose was to serve the church and society by engaging in current issues from the Christian perspective. And towards the end, we published a book series called the Ethos Institute Engagement Series. And so we are very pleased tonight to launch a new book in this series that's entitled From the Desert to the City. And we are especially privileged to have the author himself with us to give us a lecture. Let me hand the time over to our speaker, Lawrence. Thank you, Dr. Tando Ju. I want to begin by thanking all of you for taking time to join us this evening for this uh, webinar. Uh, on creation care. And I think you will agree with me that it's really great to be alive uh, in this time because we are living in a time of pandemic where millions have already uh, caught the coronavirus and hundreds of thousands have already perished. So we really want to thank God that we are able to still uh, be alive and to be able to serve Him. And we trust that tonight uh, this webinar will, in one way or another, help us to reflect a little bit more and perhaps even consider how we can live our lives in a way that will be of service, not only to God, but to all of humanity as well, in our little ways. So I want to also thank you, thank God for this opportunity uh, to sh share this uh, webinar. And, and I want to thank uh, Ethos Institute for this opportunity. This um, topic of creation care or environmental stewardship has been um, discussed in many places over the many years. Um, so what, why is there still a need for another person to write a book on this and to even contribute uh, to this discussion? Uh, my only um, desire is that this can be a contribution from Asia, uh, allowing an Asian voice to speak into this very important topic, because I don't know whether you agree with me, brothers and sisters, that uh, most of our books that we read are from the Western scholars and practitioners. So perhaps this is what the Chinese call Pao Zuan Ying Yi, you know, that we can encourage others who are listening in tonight um, and who have been doing work in creation care to see that, hey, I can do better than this <laughs> and perhaps be able to make their contribution also. Uh, tonight, we'll also be sharing, and primarily from a Christian perspective and also from a spiritual perspective because I think there are more eminent and qualified experts out there already who have been talking uh, from the scientific and uh, perhaps also more practical um, and technological 
perspective. So my desire tonight is really for us to think about it from the spiritual perspective, and I will be sharing from biblical, theological, uh, uh, and try to find understanding for us to live out our lives as, as disciples of Christ, and how can we care for God's creation. And towards the end, uh, I will be sharing some of the practical ways that we can get in, involved and to be engaged. I think um, at the end of the day, we hope that we can truly develop a Christian ethos for the Christian community so that we can begin to think about how we can live out our lives as God's servants in His creation and not just go through a laundry list of do's and don'ts uh, because a lot of all these ethical uh, pointers are still open for discussion, right? And another uh, point in this preamble is that I'm um, sharing from the perspective as a Christian pastor as well as a Christian practitioner. So it will be faith-based uh, practice um, and sharing my inf uh, reflections and inputs also from my journeys um, over different parts of Asia, especially that has taken me from the cities of uh, Sarawak and Thailand and Chiang Mai and Thailand to the cities of China and especially to Inner Mongolia. So it has been a journey of learning for me, and I want to share that uh, this little book that I've contributed from the desert to the city will be my little offering as a reflective practitioner in this field. Well, I'm still learning, and we'll welcome your feedback, your correction, and also a very uh, good discussion tonight. I'm really glad that I have an uh, opportunity to share a course on creation care in urban settings at Trinity Theological College, uh, CDCM, a few years back. And this is my hope that this book will be a, a little contribution as a resource for ongoing Christians' um, reflection, theologizing, and more importantly, helpful in your practice as you launch out to do projects and to engage the community in creation care. And we hope that pastors and churches uh, we'll also consider using this resource for your own cell group Bible study, your Sunday school, your discussions in your church uh, groups in social con concerns, and especially, as I know, some of the Christian churches are already think about doing environmental missions. So we pray that uh, God will use this in our journey towards awareness raising uh, and perhaps also taking action and learning to appreciate what God has done. Tonight, we will also focus on two aspects of creation care from the desert to the city, especially in terms of being environmental stewards and priests of creation. So this book will help us look at some of the concerns from the outbacks, from nature, which uh, I've used the, the word desert to encompass this, as well as to think about getting involved in the urban setting, the city, and looking at two roles that we can play as environmental stewards and priests of creation. So we'll be looking at all this, um, not only ethical concerns, but what we call an ontological concerns to help us find the Christian spirituality to develop uh, our journey in creation care. Well, a word about SEGM, that's where I serve, uh, that's my day job, serving in missions and promoting missions among the churches. And we are very happy that SEGM, um, thankful for my staff and my uh, council, my leaders, that they have embraced creation care way back in 2012 to be part of our global missions focus and to see that uh, this has then gone on to touch different churches. We are thankful over the last five years in particular, we have partnered the uh, English Presbytery Mission Con Conference and the Singapore Creation Care Conference, as well as uh, environmental forum organized by the Shanghai Academy of Social Science in Shanghai itself, uh, together with the UBS-China partnerships. So there are a lot of things that um, are happening and the young people in the churches are well aware. So we want to pray that uh, more Christians, more leaders and pastors, uh, as well as the mission agencies will find ways to get involved to serve God uh, in creation care in this uh, present age. You know, a lot of young people are asking the question, that uh, in spite of all this rising concerns and awareness of the environmental and ecological crisis, many churches are still not addressing these issues. 
So this book addresses a very pertinent question. What will it take to awaken Christians to the eco-crisis? What will it take to help Christians awaken to the crisis facing us? And in my book, uh, I'm suggesting that this is not just an environmental crisis, but also an ecological crisis. It impacts the whole ecosystem of life. It is not uh, only a missiological concern, but also at its root, a theological concern. And therefore, it's not only a social concern, but a spiritual concern for us. So we can't depend on the 100,000 scientists and experts. The UN tells us that there are already 100,000 experts working on this climate change and environmental issues. But the experts alone, with all the innovations and and the science and engineering will not be able to solve the problem if all 7 billion of us on earth do not participate and help contribute to the solution. Would you agree? So there's a need, therefore, to recognize that our concern is truly uh, one that uh, involves everyone. And Christians, we need to begin to pray and see how we can mobilize the churches and nudge one another along the way to participate uh, in environmental care and creation care because as I will emphasize continually through this talk, this is a spiritual concern. And this even precedes all the environmental and eco crisis because it's related to our faith, how we look at creation that is created by our Father God and that we have been given a divine commission. So we do need to understand how to unpack this to show Christians firstly that this is really a spiritual issue, it is a gospel issue, it is a discipleship issue as well as a mission issue. So tonight I won't be sharing uh, too many of the scientific arguments that there is an environmental crisis or there are the debates uh, concerning the science of climate change. But my aim is to share with believers uh, what we need to do as, as a creation and part of God's creation and as creatures. How do we take our creaturely responsibility seriously. You know, and uh, climate change over the last uh, 20 years, and even in the environmental movement that started with the late 60s, early 70s, scientists have already shown us the reality of all these extreme weathers and climatic change, global warming, environmental degradation. And those of us who have um, been to some of these places understand that these are very real. Um, in this slide, you can see the, the picture of the lady on the top right-hand corner. This is a picture taken of um, Beijing City 20 years ago. I didn't understand what this was all, all about. You know, they, they said this is a sandstorm in the city of Beijing. Until my parents were on a tour in Beijing and some of the northern parts of China, told us that when they came to one of the tourist sites in Beijing uh, and on the tour coach, to a bus, they could not alight. They said outside, it was raining sand. So I asked, what do you mean by raining sand? He said, that's what it is. It's rainy, it looks like rain, but it's no water, but it's all sand. So that's the, the problem of sandstorm. And that helped me to begin a journey to discover more about uh, sandstorms that are buffeting the cities of Northern China and how this is all caused by desertification. Right, how the grassland in northern China, in Mongolia, uh, the grasslands of Inner Mongolia have all become desertified, have become desert due to, to excessive human use and deforestation. So, and we know that um, at the 2015 Conference of Paris or the Paris Agreement, uh, over 100 countries, the leaders of countries have signed uh, the pact um, to agree to combat the two degree rise in global temperature since the Industrial Revolution. This is what we call fighting the two-degree war. And they have challenged us all to fight the two-degree war to reduce carbon emission, to reduce greenhouse gases. And uh, this is really code red. I think some of us in Singapore, we, we understand code orange you know, in this COVID-19 crisis. But this is code red for the environmental crisis. And I'm, I remember, as some of you do, that there's an adage, you know, when we were in the Boy Scouts, we, when we go hiking and camping, there was an adage to help us understand the weather conditions, to look forward to the weather for the next day. 
And it was a, an adage that goes like this. Read at night, shepherd's delight. Read in the morning, shepherd's warning. In other words, if you see a, a red evening sun, sunset, the next day will be a very nice day. But you have a red uh, morning sun, then it could be a warning that there will be rain and storm coming for the day. So we are in this uh, red alert because it is the shepherd's warning, warning to the shepherds. So this is something that we really need to awaken Christians to the reality uh, of our current challenge. Uh, I wish I will be able to show you a video, but you can uh, Google and listen to this China singer called Tan Weiwei or Sita Tan singing this song on climate change. The Chinese title is Gain Yi Dian Yan Se. In other words, uh, it is showing you a little color. So in that song, which was a fantastic fusion of Chinese traditional instruments with uh, rock music, this lady belted out and screamed aloud the colors of life. And in, in the lyrics, uh, it's amazing because she was asking with great pathos and pain, why has the sky turned gray? Why is the land no longer green? Why is the human heart not red? And why is the snow black? So this is really giving us uh, the Chinese actually has a little pun. Kini Din Yan Se actually means show you some true colors. I think in this pandemic season, we are beginning to see this in nature. Nature is beginning to show us some true colors. Firstly, how this has impacted our life, causing disruption. But secondly, also showing us that when human activities cease, the colors of nature begins to show itself. So this is a very interesting song. And perhaps this is all due to our excessive human activities uh, that has created problems in our ecosystem. Have you heard of the Anthropocene age? Well, some scientists um, tell us specul speculatively that, um, you know, when geologists would uh, excavate the earth millions of years later or billions of years later, they would find in the geology, geological strata, a new geological epoch, which they will call the Anthropocene age. This is the age of the human beings. And as Richard Bockham notes, that this idea of this Anthropocene age actually attributes the danger of human extinction uh, to our reliance on technology with its negative impact on nature. In other words, uh, there will be uh, data in the history of the earth that once upon a time, human beings lived. And when they excavate the earth, they will find all kinds of technology and perhaps a lot of plastic in the soil. This is actually a very sad commentary, don't you think, on how humans would have left our distinctive marks in a very negative way that could eventually lead to our extinction. This idea of humans living very selfishly without concerns for other non-human living things as well as the non-living things will eventually cause destruction to, to our own civilization. And this is the root um, of our lifestyle that is rooted in what we call anthropocentrism. Sorry, I'll be using some of these words. But uh, anthropocentrism basically means that we are very human-centered. We are very self-centered. We only care for what we want as human beings and uh, disregarding all non-human -li non human living things as well as non-living things. So we think that humanity is really at the center of the universe. God, who is the creator, has been supplanted by men. And Dennis Edward, a theologian, calls this our ecological sin. The actual ecological sin is not just exploiting and abusing the earth, but the fact that we have supplanted God as the center of the universe and replaced ourselves, uh, re and made ourselves as the center of the universe. Uh, so this, he calls, is the ecological sin that needs equal repentance and equal conversion. So this actually means, brothers and sisters, that as Christians, we need to recover a Christian worldview of life, of the earth of humanity, 
to have a proper view of life that is not anthropocentric. This uh, anthropocentric uh, perspective of life, uh, a very self-centered human view of life, where human is the center of everything, was first highlighted actually by a writer called Lynn White Jr. in an article published in the journal Science um, in the late 60s, in which he laid the blame of the ecological crisis on the Christian worldview of human dominion of the earth. So he, he says that actually this Christian worldview encouraged Christians to have a sense of domination and exploitation of the earth's ecosystem, uh, and where science and technology proliferated to impact um, the earth through our industrialization for the sake of economic growth. And this was seen, especially in the, the last 200 years, the 19th century and 20th century, with the rise of industrial expansionism and colonialism. And this is what he calls the historical roots of our ecological crisis. And what was the Christian response? Actually, there were some response from Christians in the early 70s. Some of us are familiar with Francis Schaeffer. His uh, famous book, Pollution and the Death of Men, was one which uh, examined this uh, debate and actually concurred that we are the ones that have caused quite a lot of uh, harm to the earth. And in fact, his challenge was that the church could actually provide the remedy, the corrective by becoming pilot plants, you know, that the church could be pilot projects, the showcase where we can demonstrate how humans can live redemptively uh, and differently for the sake of the earth under the Lordship of Christ. But I think there were too few voices and the church continued to be too slow and quiet in the response, even 50 years later. Today, young Christians are asking the question, what, where is the church in this environmental crisis? And I suggest, and I'm, I think I'm not the only one, to suggest that the lack of action and awareness by the church in this environmental crisis is sadly due to our theology, that we, especially as uh, evangelical Christians, we are the Christians who call ourselves evangelical, that we believe in in Christ, the cross, and the Bible as the Word of God, that we have a very narrow theology which is actually very anthropocentric, that our theology focuses only on human beings and specifically on saving human souls. I think many of you will agree with me that that's the gospel that we have been trained in, that the gospel of Christ is about um, accepting the salvation work of Christ on the cross so that we can believe and therefore have salvation, to be saved from our sins and to go to heaven. This is the gospel of divine redemption of human souls from sin and death. Human souls where we can have faith in Christ to assure us of salvation from eternal death. And we are very uh, good at sharing this message. So we are just moving on a passage from life on earth to eternal bliss in heaven. Snyder and Scandred in the book um, calls this uh, unbiblical divorce of heaven and earth because it has distorted the view of the kingdom of God because it has only given us an idea of a spiritualized faith and spiritualized heaven. So Christian life and mission and ministry uh, emphasizes the primacy of, of evangelism, of saving souls for heaven to the neglect of the very holistic and multifaceted aspects of life on earth. So life on earth seems very diminished in the light of eternal life in heaven. So brothers and sisters, we have perpetuated a faith that reduce our life to just individual salvation and a spiritualized salvation. So we need to go beyond the idea of uh, as um, this song goes, the spiritual song, this world is not my home. I think some of us are familiar with it. The idea that our gospel is just saving us from our real home in heaven because this world is not my home. I'm just passing through because my treasures are laid out somewhere, somewhere beyond the blue. So we need to understand, is, is the gospel message just merely escaping 
life on earth because this is not our home and they are, we are just getting a passport to heaven. Many of us are also taught that this earth will be dissolved and will be burned up and to be replaced by a new heaven and earth. You know, we have, I have friends who tell me, Lawrence, I know you really uh, love the poor, you, you care for the people who are suffering, but really our gospel is about saving souls. You know, that is the primacy and that's, it's all about our Christian faith and ministry and mission. So will the present earth be really destroyed and replaced by a new earth or will the present universe last and continue and be transformed by the Creator God for heaven? So this is what we're going to uh, look at very briefly tonight with the little time that we have. That is why we need a very robust theology and to have an adequate spirituality. And along with that, an adequate anthropology, what it means to be, to be human and to be living life on this earth so that we can have a fresh understanding of, of creation, the creator God, and therefore our responsibilities as creatures on earth. So we need to discover and recover um, what we call a more theocentric uh, perspective of life. A theocentric uh, pers perspective of life goes beyond anthropocentrism. That means we go beyond a human-centric perspective to look at a God-centric where God is the center of universe again. And we focus on God and discover how we can live life on this earth that he has created. You know, to share a little story, 25 years ago, I graduated from Trinity Theological College, actually. So at the graduation ceremony, um, my theological professor gave me a gift. You know, everyone loves to have a gift at graduation, right? So he gave me a nice uh, leather-bound Bible. And so I asked him, you know, can you uh, write an autograph for me? So Dr. Simon Cobb, my professor, actually wrote a line that says, why is there something and not nothing? Why is there something and not nothing? So here I am just uh, freshly minted with the masters and uh, divinity. And I say, wow, what's the answer? Can you tell me the answer? So he smiled and he said, the answer is found between the covers of the Bible, between Genesis and Revelation. So that is the question. Why is there something and not nothing? And then when you begin to read the Bible, actually the answers to the question of how shall we live our life on earth is actually revealed in the book of the Bible. And for those of us who are joining us tonight who are not believers, uh, I will encourage you to get a copy of the Bible and read it. Uh, but read it from Genesis 1 to, Genesis 20, uh, to Revelation 22. Because a lot of us as Christians, evangelical Christians, would you agree our... Our reading usually begins from Genesis 3, from the fall of man, from sin, and then to the salvation and judgment, and the salvation from the judgment of God. So our reading usually takes us from Genesis 3 to Revelation 20. So we need to begin with Genesis chapter 1, all the way to Revelation 22, from the creation to the new creation. And when we read Genesis 1, in verse 1 it says, in the beginning, in the beginning, God, God was at the beginning and God created, God created the heavens and the earth. And this is how our story should unfold. That God is the creator and he created out of nothing, out of darkness, out of chaos. And he created everything in heaven and the earth, both the living and the non-living things and set the living creatures in their habitats and created the ecosystems with the natural causes according to the patterns and processes of natural laws. Jonathan Moore, a theologian, highlighted that after God created in Genesis 1, there was a sevenfold divine affirmation of creation. In other words, after God created, each time he said it was good, and the seventh time, God actually said it was very good. And in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, God saw that he had all that he had made and it was very good. So creation was affirmed and valued by God and so must we. In six days, God created the non-living things and the living creatures 
and culminated in the creation of humankind. And a German theologian, Moltmann, actually pointed out that the climax and high point was not the creation of humanity, as some of us think, but that it was the fact that God rested on the seventh day. The rest from creation is the cessation of creating and the beginning of appreciating and the beginning of blessing his creation. So this rest is in anticipation of his eternal presence where God longed to be with his creation in the fullness of time in the, at the end of history with a perfected creation. And Chris Wright um, underscored the goodness of creation because he said this creation was created by a very good God according to the divine design and purpose. And I think this is very important to help us set the foundation for what we want to discuss tonight. Because God owns creation, the cosmos. It, it is the work of his hand and God will perfect the the creation at the end of history. Creation, as we know, shout the diversity, the biodiversity and the relational attribute of the divine Godhead, the Trinity that we call it, is actually reflected in God's creation because the diversity, the amazing colors and amazing uh, species that we see in nature, all this reflect the creativity and the diversity within God's uh, uh, Trinitarian uh, Godhead. So we know that humankind is also created in the image of God. And, and this image of God, we'll talk about it more as we go along. It's not just reflecting the ability to think, the intellect, but also that sense of spiritual transcendence then a relational ability to relate not only with uh, one another, but also to relate with nature, with the creatures, as well as to relate with God. So this is very important. Um, but as we know the, from the creation story, that humans fail. Uh, we fail to maintain such a good relations in harmony with God and with one another and with creation. And that's where humans fail. And there is the sin and the breakdown of this divine order into disorder, decay, and disruption. So our story from the Bible again tells us there was then the need for divine intervention to bring about again this uh, restoration of this whole uh, order that has broken down and eventually pointing to the hope of the new creation that began with the incarnation of Christ. And it is very interesting because when we look at the incarnation of Christ, um, uh, it means that Christ, the Son of God, the divine, becoming human, taking on the human form. And this is uh, something that C.S. Lewis um, puts it very beautifully. He says, the creator God, the incarnation of Christ is like Christ, the creator, loves his, his uh, creation so much. is like a, an artist that loves the painting that he has painted, that he decides to enter into the painting and to live with all the creatures he has painted on the canvas. Right? So that is a very uh, great miracle, and we call it a paradox. How can God become man? Um, another theologian calls this incarnation the deep incarnation. Because Christ entered the, the ecosystems, entered the biosphere, so that he entered and understood our conditions in uh, the biosphere, the life of creation. But we thank God that uh, God has created creation, you know, in, and set it on its course with its patterns and processes. And cre creation itself understands and worships God. Uh, my friend Ed. Brown says that creation actually is like a choir that is in worship of God, and perhaps humankind are like the choir master, um, joining creation in responding to God in worship. And this is the, the meaning of uh, the cross, the Christ that has come in the incarnation to bring us this sense of redemption, so that what was broken uh, in the Old Testament as we learned, how human beings did not follow the divine order, can now be restored through Christ. This is called the redemption. The redemption through the cross of Christ. And allowing us to be part of the new creation that has been restored by Christ's work on the cross. So the cross of Christ actually is not just, my brothers and sisters, for the salvation of human souls, but it is also for the redemption of the whole universe 
for the whole of nature and creation, the cosmos. So there is a cosmic dimension in the work of Christ on the cross that impacts not only human souls, but also the whole universe. Dennis Edward calls Easter, therefore, the celebration of creation transformed. And the church must really be the first to understand this because we as a church, we are the, the first fruits of this messianic hope and the creation, uh, the new creation in Christ because we are, along with the resurrected Christ, the first fruits of the new humanity. And this comes with the messianic hope that is in Christ. And that's where the perfect response in this eco-crisis is that the church must ask ourselves, how can we live? How shall we live so that we can witness to this new hope that has been accomplished by Christ on the cross and this hope that is for the new heaven and earth? Douglas Moo um, notes that our emphasis on salvation gospel, focusing on human souls, leads us to read the New Testament uh, without uh, so much referencing the Old Testament. And sometimes we forget that God's salvation purpose started from the Old Testament all through to the New Testament, and that there is continuity between the Old Testament and New Testament. And this is especially true with the promise of the land and the idea of the new heaven and earth that was already mentioned by the Old Testament prophets. Uh, we won't have time to go into a very uh, detailed account about eschatology or what um, the new heaven and earth will be, but suffice it to say that, uh, that uh, the theologians have debated this and help us to understand that the language of Revelation actually has a lot of references to the original creation in the Genesis 1, and that there will be a reversal of the curse and return to the conditions of Eden, and in fact, beyond Eden. And to theologians such as Mu refers to the language as metaphor that uh, help us to understand the, the passages from especially 2 Peter 3.10 that talks about the destruction of heaven and earth and everything in it by fire and how all the elements will dissolve and melt away. That all this uh, metaphorical language, they help us to understand destruction in the form of judgment uh, without physical annihilation. And that it is a language of transformation where God, through this, purge and consume all evil so that within the new creation, there will be no more evil so that there will be truly a perfected creation at the end of history in the new creation. So Douglas Moo here offers the concept of transformation within continuity as he compares the liberation of the gospel of the cosmos to the doctrine of bodily resurrection where there is significant continuity of some kind. In other words, when we die, you know, when we talk about the resurrected life, the resurrected self, it is not a completely new person. Uh, this is, the, this is the, what the Christian belief that the old person will continue to live, but in a resurrected body. There is continuity in the personality and the soul. So this is the same with the continuity of this world with the next. And Roland Chia, who is one of our panelists here, uh, sees this, a very interesting thing, that the new creation of God is uh, God's redemptive redemption act, not only for humanity, but for the whole creation. He believes that God's a creation is not nullified, but perfected, affirming the patristic and Calvinist view of the new creation as the transformation of this present cosmos into the state of perfection. Right, I'm sorry, this is not a class on eschatology, but we do need to understand a little bit of our theological framework. Uh, and a lot of Christians has been uh, taught this, that all oh, this you know, whole earth and universe today will eventually one day be folded up, wrapped up, and the earth will burn, and we'll be all living in spaceship in outer space. So this is perhaps a more dispensationalist uh, perspective. But here we, we can reference the idea that uh, perhaps the end of the world cannot be annihil annihilation, as Roland Chap puts it, and then a new creation comes. But rather, it is a transformation of the present world, and this is in line with God's faithfulness to creation so that he will ensure that the creation will achieve its telos, its purpose, 
that has been designed right from the beginning, despite the disruption caused by the, by the fall. It does this not by destroying the cosmos and creating a new one, but by transforming and bringing to perfection this present creation. Right? So this, um, this is again affirmed by Chris Wright, who sees that the new creation after this judgment uh, will actually prepare us to enjoy the new dwelling place with God. You know, and heaven is actually the place where God comes to dwell with creation, with his creatures again. And this would explain, again, the faithfulness and love of God and point to the supremacy of Christ in the whole universe when the extent of the reconciliation and restoration in Christ is revealed at the end of time. Right? So if you want to find out more, um, you can read my book to understand what it means for us to have this messianic hope um, in Christ. There's a lot of exciting things for us to think about because the theological framework must undergird our engagement in creation care. So uh, very quickly, I'd like to highlight two models for us to consider how we can serve God in terms of caring for his creation. The first uh, model is what we call the ethical model. This is a model that is quite familiar to many of us because it has been used also um, in the non-religious uh, circles, in the secular uh, place, called environmental stewardship. But as Christians, when we look at environmental stewards, we are wanting to recover the theocentric uh, life, that we come back to a vision of God at the center of our lives, at the center of the universe. So this is based, again, on God's creation of mankind. In Genesis 1, that we've been given the commission to fill the earth to subdue and to have dominion over all the living things. But again, not as uh, Lynn White suggested that we have not only have dominion, but domination and exploitation of the earth. But this idea of environmental stewardship under God's ownership is a concept that is taking care of God's resources and managing them as God has commissioned us and called us to do. Actually, uh, a note to say about Lynn White's paper that we mentioned earlier on, he, uh, he placed the blame on this whole environmental crisis on Christians because we have just developed a very spiritual life that doesn't take into con consideration the earthly life and therefore we have lived um, life exploiting and abusing uh, Earth's resources and degraded it. But in his second part of the paper, he actually pointed to the solution, which is also Christian, which is also religious, that uh, referencing St. Francis of Assisi pointed out that there can be a different approach to care for God's creation. And this is the approach of environmental stewardship because we are to return to God's purpose for his creation and to realize that uh, this is our creaturely uh, responsibility, our creation mandate, which is to maximize God's creation and natural resources and use it according to God's pattern. And what, what are some of God's pattern? Can I suggest very quickly that one of that is this ethical framework of God's design, which is called the Shalom model, uh, which, is, which means that it reflects the righteousness of God, God's ways and God's economy and God's kingdom. Um, this is reflected in the Shabbat or the Sabbath uh, principle where we are to rest on the seventh day, just as God rested on the seventh day in the creation uh, in Genesis 1. And the sabbatical principle of rest is applicable to the cycle of seven years, where the seventh year is also a year of rest, and then to the concept of jubilee, where after seven cycles of seven years rest, the 50th year is also a rest year. So this concept of rest is important for refreshing and renewing not only the person, but is also applicable for living things as well as the non-living things in creation. So it is something that as Christians, as environmental stewards, we need to recover and put it actively into our creation mandate, into our work, into our life, into our rhythm, so that there is seen in this sabbatical principle, in this shalom, in this jubilee concept, the concept that is centered around God, God's purpose for his creation. And this helps us to understand that God, God's purpose, especially in the concept of Jubilee, in the concept of the Sabbath, is a concept of redemption, 
where debt is forgiven, bonded labor and mortgage lands are released, slaves are freed, and land returned and restored to families so that it is like what we call a reset button so that those who have been in debt and those who have lost in the game, so to speak, in the game of life, they can once again reset and play, but play and start from anew. Where families that have been forced to separate because of poverty and hardship can be brought together again and given the resources that they once were given and begin again with dignity and to participate in the social life in the community. So these concepts are very important so that we begin to understand that poverty and shame and humiliation and oppression do not continue and perpetuate from, from generations to generation. This, is, this will at most last one generation and you will be given a reset in the 50th year. So this rhythm of rest and rhythm and redemption and restoration must inform and inspire our environmental stewardship so that we can also learn to rest, recover and be restored for better productivity in our work and for creativity in our life. And the same for nature too, because the land needs to uh, lay fallow and rest and nutrients can be rejuvenated. So the theology of the Sabbath and the Jubilee, uh, which we have no time to elaborate here, all underscore a very important point, And that is all points to the sovereignty of God. The earth is the Lord's and all in it. God is sovereign. And we need to take this message to our heart. So as stewards of the environment, we must understand and recover this ethical model with God as the center, with God as the focus to ensure that we will not drive human beings and non-human beings and uh, non-living things to the ground so that nature becomes depleted and degraded and human beings and creatures will all also be destroyed. This stewardship model challenges to think through the implications in the way we live our life, especially in this post-COVID era, and to take rest seriously and to develop responsible ways for this implementation. Basically, this is a call for us to return to God, to repent and to recover God's ways and be restored according to His kingdom principle. Secondly, and very quickly now, because our time is running out, pre, the priest of creation. The second model is the ontological model where we are called to be God's priest of God's creation. This was actually proposed by uh, an orthodox theologian called John Zizoulas. And this concept of the priesthood, I think we are familiar in the Old Testament because priests have uh, been in, a, in Genesis all the way when you can think about Abraham and the meeting of the priest Melchizedek, and later on to Jethro, of the priest of Midian, and later Aaron and his sons were called to be the priests, to pray and call uh, the people to pray and worship God, and to offer sacrifices on behalf of the people. In fact, the people of Israel were called to be a kingdom of priests, to serve God, their king. So the model of creation care based is based on this priesthood principle, which is a worship model. It's a call again to return from an anthropocentric life to a theocentric life that culminates in not only service of God, but the worship of God and a call to call others to worship. So in the Old Testament, priests actually play a very important role, not only in temple worship, but also in the life of the community. Uh, they oversee the health and hygiene issues as well as the care of the animals in the community. So they would actually be very key if a disease or a pandemic should strike because they would be, be the ones marshalling how to manage and contain the spread of this disease in the community. So they are not merely men of the cloth engaged in religious activities, but they are really practical people uh, involved in the life of the community. So in the priesthood model, however, we move from the practical, pragmatic and materialistic a functional basis of life to a spiritual basis. By recovering the, the priesthood model, we begin to understand human beings as we are called, not to just to do things, but to be. It's a move from doing to being, from the moral to the cultural, and from ethics to ethos. So this is ethos lecture, right? So we need to think about what are the ethos, what is the cultural ethos, that we can build that's based on our spirituality in order to be effective 
uh, in caring for creation. The priesthood model emphasizes not the functionality like in the stewardship model, but the ontological basis that we are called to worship. Uh, let me explain a little. Zizulas proposed the idea of priest of creation to complement the idea of stewardship model because he says that human beings in the, made in the image of God, we are actually made with the capacity of reason and freedom to think as well as to transcend and to create like God, to co-create a cosmos and have the capacity to unite the world. So in other words, we, are the, we have the ability to communicate and commune with God as well as to play the role to bring creation in, through our organic link to be able to develop this link and unite all things in God, to bring and unite what is what we call the finite into the infinite model. And Zizulas uh, uses the Eucharist, the, the Holy Communion model, to show us what the priest does, in fact. So in the priesthood image enacted here at the Eucharist, the priest lifts up the bread and the wine and uh, lifts it up to God, which represents the fruit of our labor to God. And in that picture, humanity in harmony with creation is lifted up to God. And this is really the anaphora. They call it the lifting up of our offering to God, which is the lifting up of God's gift in creation, now given to us, rendered by a touch of human hands and presented it back to God. This act of lifting up or anaphora is the liturg liturgical reenacting of the priest to recover the sacred in creation. And as creation is offered back to God, creation is also consecrated. Chris Wright calls this uh, the sanctification of creation. Not that creation is sacred, but because it is created by God, it belongs to God, and now is lifted back to God, lifted up back to God, it is sanctified. It is sacred. So Zizulas pointed out that this perhaps is one of the main reasons why God has created human beings, to play the role after he has created the whole of creations with the non-living things and the living things. And he, he puts men, we are literally the late arrival, the last on the scene, and with a divine responsibility, a divine commission with a responsibility to fulfill this, to lift up creation in worship with God, in worship to God, rather. So this is important. Um, and especially as Christians now, we are encouraged to fulfill this role of priesthood, which Israel abdicated because Israel was called to be a kingdom of priests, but he abdicated. They did not fulfill their role. But in Christ, our high priest, now we have been given this new responsibility and privilege to be God's priest. And God wants us to now live out our role as God's royal priesthood, a holy nation. And we can become the new humanity, then develop a new anthropology that will allow us to play this role uh, of lifting creation in worship to God. And Martin Luther in the Reformation also reminded us, especially as Protestants, we are called to recover this universal priesthood of believers so that we can serve God as priests wherever he has placed us and there's no more secret, secular divide. As in all vocations, we can lift up the work of our hands in worship of God and uh, recover our original calling as priests of creation. Let me share a little story which will illustrate how this can be played out in real life. Now, this is one of my favorite stories of this man enacting his priestly role in the desert as a uh, priest of creation. This is the story of Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. It's a French name. I don't know whether I've uh, pronounced it correctly. He's a Jesuit priest who, is also, who was also a scientist, a paleontologist, and he served in Inner Mongolia with a team that discovered the skull of the Peking men in the middle of the, mid, uh, of the 20th century. He was serving uh, as a priest uh, also as a scientist. So every Sunday as a priest, he would don his black robe and I can imagine he would go out to the desert in this uh, desert scene that you can see. There's really nothing but the desert sands and the sky. There's no church. So the, the desert sky and the desert land becomes his sanctuary 
and nature his congregation. And then he will kneel down in the sand, he picks up a rock and breaks it with his geologist's hammer and lifts it up to God saying, this is the body of Christ broken for you. And then he takes his chalice, the cup, and scoops up the sand, lifts it up and then pours it out saying, this is the blood of Christ poured out for you. In that act, he remembers the labor of our hand and the suffering in our lives and lift them up to God as a fitting offering lifted before God. And that makes life uh, and makes our role as the priest of creation meaningful in what he calls the divine milieu. So Tela Di Shodan gives us an image of what we do as priests of creation and we can live and to work and appreciate all that God has given to us in worship and lifting them up to become sanctified and sacred. And Zizulas was the one who noted that when we offer up our, our sacraments in the our Eucharist, very interestingly, we don't offer up just flour or wheat and grapes, but we offer up bread and wine, which is processed uh, or processed resources. We have taken nature, natural resources, processed, processed it, made it into our cultural products and lifted up lifted them up to God in our worship and God is pleased with this. Okay, very quickly, I'd like to, to also introduce um, two aspects of spirituality which will, be which will help us to develop a more adequate spirituality for living as priests of creation as well as environmental stewards, uh, especially in the context of the city. Uh, very quickly, these two words, um, Eschesis and kenosis. These are words that are familiar to the desert fathers. These were people uh, in Christian history, in church history. We know that there was this group of people called the monastics. They live in convents and the monasteries. And these were the ones, the monks and the nuns, whom Martin Luther actually asked them to leave the cloisters, to go out into the world and fulfill their vocation in the world. But these were the ones originally. Um, were pre preceded by the desert fathers, Christians who fled to the desert not to pursue spirituality and become spiritual gurus per se. Right? They were seeking to, to avoid and fight the temptations of the world and to be transformed with the love of Christ so that they can serve others. So these this, uh, desert fathers eventually became very spiritual people who had great compassion in their hearts. And I'd like to highlight these two traits of eschesis and kenosis for us to consider uh, as we live out our lives today in the modern world, in the city. Eschesis is the Greek word and the root word for asceticism. I think we are familiar with asceticism. It is a life that is full of uh, rigorous self-discipline uh, for the aim of spiritual growth. And we often associate it with self-torture very severe and austere life as abstinence from food and sex and pleasures and so on. But actually, if we look at it, it is a spiritual discipline where we can recover for our life today and for our discipleship and for creation care because it is a discipline of self-denial, of learning to live with the little that we have. In fact, to live with less, living a life of simplicity. And we can learn to eat less and not waste food we can fast even and not to indulge. We can learn to buy less things and own less things and indeed avoid and abstain from things that will cause us to fall into temptation and evil. It is a call to live simply so that others can simply live. It is a life that is lived with a focus on God, with more gratitude, with greater appreciation of life and of people and things around us without needing to possess them or to own them. And therefore, out of this kind of desert spirituality and escapes, we can develop a heart of caring and compassion. Secondly, kenosis is a Greek word which means self-emptying. And this was used by the Lord Jesus Christ who humbled himself and became incarnate as a human being. He embraced poverty and powerlessness. Christ, who was God, considered himself nothing so that he can become human being. and incarnate himself within our biosphere, as we mentioned. But he also learned to be self-emptying and he chose to downgrade. So this idea of kenosis perhaps is an idea of downgrading in our lifestyle. It is counter-cultural, especially in our culture, 
and very radical because we live in a world of constant upgrading. We want to upgrade. We want to promote ourselves, self-promotion and self-aggrandizement. Out of kenosis can come perhaps a spirit of gentleness and of healing rather than aggression and of hurting others. And perhaps this is why John Stott calls this very radical discipleship because the root word of radical is actually root, to return to the roots, and the root is Jesus Christ himself. So let us cultivate a desert spirituality based on this, asperses and kenosis, and develop a spirituality of caring and compassion, of gentleness and healing, that we begin to learn to tread gently, to learn to protect the weak and the powerless among us. This spirituality and ethos is found in Christ and the cross, which is the true hope of the earth. So Mortman reminds us that actually our faith finds in the cross the hope of the earth. Our faith is not escaping into heaven. It is rooted on earth because it, it espouses in all meekness the causes of the devastated earth and of harassed humanity because it is a promised possession of the earth. So with that, I want to turn very quickly to show you what are some of the things we can do in practical ways in the city as we move from conservation and environmental projects and concerns uh, in the outbacks in nature to the city. And I want to encourage Christians, especially as Singaporeans, we are living in a very, very urban neighborhood. But do we take time to look at the city beyond ourselves, beyond our families? We need to develop a transcendent perspective. I think architects understand transcendent perspective. That means it is a vantage point from on high, looking down at a community, looking down on life. And we need that perspective because that is also the divine perspective. So we need that to develop a spirituality of caring in the city. And what do we see in the city? Brothers and sisters, cities are really the mission field of the 21st century. We begin to see that cities are not just the citadels of men and the, the efforts of men per se, uh, but we find in the city there is also this problem of great divide. There's a great divide uh, between the rich and the poor, and we are beginning to see that even in this uh, pandemic crisis. We find that every city, every district, every street itself is actually an ecosystem. It is an habitat, and not only for human beings, but also for the non-human beings and the non-living things around us. And to transcend and live in the city, we need to begin to have an understanding of life in the city. And in the urban slums especially, you'll find that uh, this is very real. The, this picture is a picture that I took of a family living in the urban slums in one of the city's metropolis in Southeast Asia. And there he was enjoying his lunch, but it's all around him is actually rubbish because he, the family lives in a rubbish dump. So we begin to see that Christ would care for this harassed humanity living in places like this. And as Christians, I think it is time for action. And we begin to understand a bit of this since the last few years with the young people standing and rising up in the various, various movements in the world. So we begin to see the Occupy movement, the Extinction Rebellion movement, and now the Black Lives Matter movement. These are times of angst in the city, time calling for change and for action. And it is time that Christians begin to engage beyond our spiritual salvation gospel to think about what we can do in the cities. So what happened was um, that over the last few years, very quickly, SCGM, we've been privileged to partner different organizations, including the Urban Shalom Project to organize the Urban Shalom Forum in Singapore. And we have uh, this theme of the gospel and the future of cities. It is great that we can bring architects, engineers, business people, policy makers, and government leaders. And we had as our keynote speaker, Mr. Lim Seong Guan, uh, in this forum to talk about the gospel and the future of cities. You know, it's often said that we shape the cities and afterwards, the cities shape us. So can Christians really, who are the eschatological community of the world, that we are the people from God's um, community in the future, now back living here in the present, can we 
bring in God's kingdom righteousness and perspective and input that in the building of the cities. This is very important for us to consider. And we were also happy that year to organize with the WEA Creation Care Task Force, the first faith-based urban thinkers campus. Uh, and we talk about the new urban agenda, which was a part of the SDG, the Sustainable Development Goals, that was highlighted in Habitat 3 conference in Quito in 2016. So in that discussion on the new urban agenda, we were able to bring together people from different faith um, and uh, backgrounds to be able to input into this new urban agenda, which primarily addresses the problems of prosperity, poverty, and resilience, especially in building sustainable and livable cities. So again, we've talked about the, the Sabbath concept, the Jubilee concept. Christians, we have a lot of ideas and uh, a lot of godly divine principles from the Bible that we need to think how we can integrate it into our urban living today and building the cities of tomorrow. So I want to encourage Christians in the church, in the pews, whether you're working in the government, in business, in academia, think of how you can participate and contribute to all this discussion for the SDG uh, leading up to 2030. And we will encourage students as well in secondary schools and tertiary institutions, if you are going to do their research or writing a paper, research on SDG and think about how we can build sustainable cities. We are happy also at SEGM to have produced a collection of all this um, paper documenting the innovative, creative, pioneering efforts of Christians in business, in, in government, in social enterprise, as we build cities that can make a difference, that can impact lives, transform the destinies of families and communities and cities. So we want to encourage more Christians to be trailblazer, to think and participate in this. 2012, I was very glad to be part of this Lausanne conference on creation care uh, and the gospel. And out of that conference was this book, Creation Care and the Gospel. And I want to encourage Christians, if you don't have time to look at this very important document, but if you are looking for practical things to do as Christians in creation care, there are 10 specific calls, uh, specific points in the call to action, um, including a new commitment to live simple lifestyle, which we mentioned just now, that we need a new and robust theology. theology. So we need theologians to work on this. Leadership from the church in the global south, mobilization of the whole church, and engagement of all society. The church can be a mobilizer. And we can develop environmental missions among the unreached people groups. We need to develop radical action to confront climate change. Time to take climate change action. Sustainable principles in food production. And I know many of us here are beginning to think about going back to become farmers and become urban farmers. So think about not only food production, but what it takes to bring the food from the farm to the fork, to the plate. An economy that works in harmony with God's creation. We need the economists to help us think, how do we build a new economic model that goes beyond the GDP growth model that will be in harmony with God's principles of justice and his kingdom? Number nine, local expressions of creation care which preserve and enhance biodiversity and prophetic advocacy and healing reconciliation. Right? So there are many of these uh, points here you can think about. And in the next few slides, uh, and I'll just uh, show you very quickly in the next five minutes, what you can do. And uh, these are exciting things because these are expressions from Singapore, from Asia and in Asia. You can, churches can begin to organize environmental missions. And you can see, you can mobilize not only Christians, but even non-believers to work together to pursue the common good across ethnic, cultural, and religious divides. And we can begin to take climate actions that will serve, actually, the poor who bear the brunt of all this environmental degradation. Have you heard of the Green Desert Project? It was a project that was started by yours truly with volunteers and friends way back in 2002. And this was inspired by the prophetic voice of Amos 5 and Isaiah chapter 35 and 43 and 61, 
where we can be a prophetic voice and a priestly presence um, in the different parts of uh, cities as well as countryside. And specifically, over the last 18 years, we have mobilized youths to plant trees over 50 acres of desertified grassland in Inner Mongolia. And this was supported by the National Youth Council and the Singapore International Foundation, for which we are very glad. And we, we were able to mobilize um, youths from the universities, polytechnics, and the ITEs. So we, we started with two types of projects, actually water treatment um, and cleaning rivers, as well as planting trees, right? These are the two things that in Singapore we are quite proud of, that we can do well, and we showcase some of our membrane technology as well. So how can we leverage on what we have in Singapore and take it to the rest of Asia? So over the past 18 years, we've got 700 youths now working with us and planted, uh, planted 30,000 trees in Inner Mongolia and developed projects um, as well from Shanghai to Nanjing, from Beijing to Inner Mongolia, as well as from Sarawak to Chiang Mai and Manila. And all this is not just about planting trees, but actually planting seeds of understanding of environmental education. And we are really glad that we can help to fight the two degree war and combat climate change. And in caring for nature, we also discover we are caring for culture because the people that we care about, the unreached people groups, I know some of us who are involved in missions talk about the UPGs. Do you know that they are the beneficiaries of these environmental projects because over the 20 years, we have interacted with the Hui Muslim, the Mongolians, and the Iban people in Sarawak, and the Korean people in Chiang Mai. So there are lots of uh, things that we can appreciate, not only nature, but the culture of the people. What can we do? Encourage all of us to start small, start where we are. We started with children and took them on projects. We have the Green Desert Kids Club project, and we took them from Sunday schools, um, before after care schools, from the scout groups, you know, all the way to the different parks and passeries in Pongo, from Bedok Reservoir to Pulau Ubin. And we are glad to partner the N parks in some of these projects as we help the young people love uh, to understand and love nature and to understand the challenges of creation care and climate change. We need more of you to come alongside and you can become ambassadors to bring talks like this on Earth Day when schools have their Earth Day assembly talks. And we need uh, young people who can become ambassadors and we can train and promote you to become speakers and keynote speakers in school events and community events. It's been tremendous as we mobilize young people and mentor them. And this group of volunteers from RJC, uh, they have come alongside and become the MCs, the speakers and event organizers and media producers for some of our programs. And in the same way, uh, we've worked with IT youths. The first Green Desert video was produced by five students from the IT College East. They were seconded to us for overseas attachment. So they spent two weeks in Inner Mongolia, filmed the project, and did the post-production with two media professionals whom I recruited to mentor them. And our second Green Desert project video was also produced by IT College West team. And some of them, out of this experience, they have actually gone ahead to register a media production company and started business in this way. So it's, it's fun. So we can mobilize young people for advocacy and become community champions. Um, and we are glad that some of them have gone on to win the NYAA awards and environmental awards in schools. And here I was invited by the Chinese radio FM 95.8 for an hour-long live show to share about the Green Desert Project to become um, a, a voice you know, for the community, in the community. And this was set up by, again, student volunteers. And we want to thank God also for one student volunteer that was writing for Cao Pao. So she managed to write a piece on our project and was published in the newspaper. Performing arts can be a great way to be used for awareness raising here in this event by the Nanyang Academy of Fine Arts. We find that uh, this is where they use drama to stage Po Pao Kun's play, Silly Girl and a Strange Old Tree, and was fantastic for bringing awareness about environmental concerns. 
Right? So lots of outreach opportunities that you can organize, where the youths can organize it and have young people to be the speakers and sharing and collecting and generating ideas how they can solve this problem in their generation. So take this opportunity, even in your church, you can invite speakers like what we did for the SEGM dinner and invited Dr. Chong Kun Hien, who was the CEO of HDB, to speak on why cities matter to the church. So finally, let me end by saying, why do we, how do we awaken Christians to this, this eco-crisis? Perhaps it could be just as simple as a point that we need to care because God cares. God is the creator, God is the owner, and he has called us to be stewards and priests of his environment. And it points, as we care for God's creation, it points to the eschatological event and vision where God will come and live among us and make his dwelling among us. So you're interested, you can uh, order a book, Can the Desert Be Green? This can be available from the SEGM office. We need to continue to pray and uh, ask God to help us understand how we can learn to serve as stewards and priests of God's creation. And may God use this seminar to raise up more Christians who will go out and take action and serve God in the community in the world and participate in our priestly role to care and pray for God's creation.